Is Disney bad at Star Wars? This is Digital Shark. Could we force push the like button, hit subscribe, and ding the bell to stay up to date with all of our Star Wars videos and more. We do a lot. We talk a lot of stuff here on the channel. We're a charcuterie board of digital content. Guys, let me know your thoughts on this article in the comments down below. I want to hear from you. Is Disney bad at Star Wars? Let's get right to it. Trying to just live my life as best I can without worrying about if Disney is good at Star Wars or not. It turns out they're not, according to a Hollywood reporter who published an article on if they're good at Star Wars. I'm going to have a video on how to save Star Wars on Rebel Scum Podcast later tonight. But this, I thought this was appropriate. We should talk about this article because it might be ridiculous. It might be great. I don't know. I don't know. I've only skimmed it. I've read it. But it, look, it brings up some good points and there's some good conversation to be had. I know a lot of you clicking on it probably like, Disney ruined Star Wars or Disney saved Star Wars. It's like, you know, like I hear it from both ends and it's tiring. So let's just have a conversation and discuss if it's good or if it's bad or what they should do. Or maybe nothing, because maybe George Lucas didn't know what Star Wars was either. We're going to find out. We're going to find out. This is We are going to find out. Let's pull up the article here. As I said, it's from... Ooh, geez, there we go. It's from the Hollywood Report. Like, of all the things to comment on this, it's the freaking Hollywood Reporter. Like, just blows my mind that they have nothing better to write about right now than is Disney bad at Star Wars. Spoiler alert, they are. But I mean, okay, for us, if we start with these three images, they're pretty dope Star Wars images. They take what, like the movies, the shows away for a second, and you're like, look, we're going to get this. I'd probably watch these. Anyway, is Disney bad at Star Wars? An analysis. Uh, high budget, scrap projects, fan backlash. It's been 12 years since Disney bought Star Wars, and its galaxy far, far away arguably has too many broken toys. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't disagree. I don't disagree. There's a lot of broken toys. We'll get to that. There's an exchange in Star Wars The Force Awakens when Rey and Finn are fleeing from stormtroopers and searching for a way to escape. Rey spots the legendary Millennium Falcon, declares it looks the it looks like garbage. A highlight from the movie, for sure. Increasingly, that's the attitude some fans have had about Disney's Star Wars programming. Look, we all know this isn't fantastic anymore, but Star Wars is still Star Wars, and therefore it will do. And therefore it will do. I've seen that kind of sentiment online quite a lot. I think I've had it a couple of times. And and I think where this is going is we all kind of, I think, reached our peak, our pinnacle at uh, our breaking point, if you will, with the accolade. I think that was kind of like the tipping point for where we stood at, on our views as it, because sometimes, you know, we got something that was a little subpar and we're like, you know what? Hey, hey, it was Star Wars. It's better than not having Star Wars. You know, like, you know, sometimes you watch a TV show and the episode's not very good. And you're like, well, an episode of this show is still better than, I'd still rather get a, a bad episode of this show than, you know, a, a good show of something terrible. I guess that's a weird way of phrasing it, but I know what they're saying. <laughs> I think I think a lot of people are at the tipping point. To be fair, Disney Star Wars shows and movies remain far from space junk. Their titles typically get glowing reviews from critics and generate box office returns and streaming ratings that other studios would envy, though at a high cost. So let's run through Disney Star Wars legacy to date from The Force Awakens to Accolade and see what conclusions might be drawn because several aspects of the company's track record admittedly look shaky. A five movie franchise that has halted, that was halted after its box office returns trended the wrong direction. Six live action TV shows, just one of which has been a multi season hit, a startling number of projects put into development and then abandoned like Starships on Braca, and one wildly ambitious role play hotel that closed after a little more than a year. It raises a question Is Disney kind of bad at Star Wars? Or is this a case where a very high bar for success combined with a passionate fandom's gripes tend to obscure what is otherwise a hugely popular and lucrative franchise? Let's take a look. I think it's a little bit of both, frankly. I do. I think it's a little bit of both. I think, they, I think they've swung and missed on a few things. And I think they've tried to do things that they probably shouldn't have done necessarily you know when you have lore and myth i'm going to talk about this again tonight on rebel scum but like when you have a lore and mythology and characters that fans love 
and gravitate to and appreciate to it, when you start to take that, when you start not, not not take it away, but when you start to change it and modify it and revamp it, and in some cases modernize it, it doesn't work. And when you modernize lore and mythology, lore and mythology lasts forever because it's timeless. Modernizing it makes it modern and therefore has an expiry date. And that, you know, that's something. The film's let the past die. Kill it if you have to. My Kylo Ren is spot on. Uh, but I do. After buying Lucasfilm from George Lucas in 2012, Disney relaunched Star Wars as a franchise trilogy in 2015 with director J.J. Abrams. The Force Awakens. The film was an absolute blockbuster. Yet, surprisingly, and as it turned out, problematically, the studio did not have a firm creative plan for the next two films. At least not one that was followed because they did have a plan. They had a George Lucas treatment for three movies. And I think J.J. Abrams had, we, I know we like to bash him and everything and probably right. So, but I think he had a little bit of an outline going on and they didn't follow it at all. And part of the problem was that the other problem they mentioned right there is they like a trilogy of films. They handcuffed themselves to just making three more movies. They're like, we're going to do three movies and that's going to be it. We're done. We're moving on from that. Uh, there's no going forward. Like you, you, when you say we're going to end this in three movies, why? Like if you, if you buy it, you can do whatever you want with it. Have the story continue. Now you've handcuffed yourself to three movies, especially when they either had a plan that they, they got rid of and they would have got rid of that plan early too. Cause Ryan Johnson would have come in and been like, I don't like that plan. I'm changing the plan. And they would have signed off and said, okay, fine. That's great. So now just don't now make more movies. Now be like, we have to flesh this out a little bit more. We'll go a little bit further. We'll conclude, you know, the Ray, whoever the hell Ray is storyline, right? Like the one, two, three, we'll find out who Ray is flesh, like conclude that or whatever. And we'll move on. We don't have to rush to the finish line like they did, which is frustrating. And fans, fans see this, especially fans who've been reading novels for 30, 20, 30 years, whatever it was at this point. Like they've been reading books for a long period of time that were fleshed out. A lot of them were fleshed out. I mean, the trilogies were shown that there was a plan in those things like the Thrawn trilogy, obviously I'm, uh, I would refer to there. Like, Fans knew Dark Empire. People like fans had an expectation going in that I think surpassed what Disney thought, and even what prior to that George Lucas. I don't think George Lucas quite understood Star Wars the way Star Wars fans understand Star Wars because it was his baby. He knew exactly what was going on, but fans around it, like we see it from a different perspective, and we're getting more material, and we have this understanding that he might not see eye to eye with. Like his sequel trilogy would have been all about the Wills and and midi chlorians and. That would have gone over swimmingly. Ryan Johnson's 2017 sequel, The Last Jedi, took the story in a different direction that many loved and many didn't. Oh boy, there's an understatement. Then Abrams returned with 2019's The Rise of Skywalker and tried to push the narrative closer to his original intentions. Absolutely, absolutely. Abrams, The Rise of Skywalker is like a is like a sequel, a true sequel to The Force Awakens. Whereas uh, The Last Jedi, I always I said this way years ago, years ago. The Last Jedi, whether you like it or hate it, that's not what I'm talking about here. It was like 7.5. It was like it was like Joker fully a dude. What is the Joker? It's like it's like an extension. It's the it's just an extension of Star Wars. It's not it's not like it wasn't really episode eight. It was like 7.5. It kind of pushed the narrative, but just kind of like gave you a little bit more in that direction didn't go full full speed ahead to what it was and and jj abrams you know he he wanted to tell the story he wanted to tell comedians learn in improv class to always say yes and to any idea introduced during a show no matter how challenging the studio and abrams reaction to the last Jedi was more like no actually ray is a nobody no she's a palpatine the result was was a trilogy that's a mishmash of dueling creative visions lucas took a similar I'm making this up as I go approach to this original trilogy, but it's far easier to maintain a Sega's cohesion when all the films are led by the same person. Absolutely. This is the argument from the people that say, well, Lucas did it. Well, Lucas made it all up. He did, but he was one person. So he could, it's a lot easier for him to stream like that. The other side of that coin is he was making it up as he went. I like he had his like uh, treatments and whatever, but he's making it up as he went along. He was like Luke and Leia weren't brother and sister. He was making this crap up as he went along. The, the thing that he, the benefit he had to that was there was no 40 years pre -ex of, of lore pre existing what he was doing. There was no, like, when you compare Snoke to Palpatine, you're like, well, you don't have to know Snoke's backstory. You don't know Palpatine's backstory because there wasn't 40 years of freaking Star Wars before that. There was no history of Star Wars before that. 
It was just the guy. It was a dude. Snoke. We're coming into Snoke six after six movies. Where was he for those six previous movies? And the prequels, you can get away with it easier too because they come before again. You could be like, well, there was this guy, Plagueis. He was in the background. You can do that. You can't do that with Force Awakens. And if you do it, you've got to explain to the audience why you're doing it. What's why? Why? Who is Snoke? Who is Snoke? The greatest question to never well, to get an answer, I guess. But uh, who is Snoke was so much fun. Wish they didn't just piss all over that. Uh, the film's box office also told a story at a time when Disney's Marvel movies kept breaking new ticket sales records. Force made an extraordinary two billion dollars worldwide. Jedi dropped sharply to a still huge one point three billion, and then Skywalker made one billion, which is you know still a billion these are incredible numbers for any film but they are but they were going the wrong the wrong way when the third entry in your trilogy launching a new franchise sells half as many tickets as the first you probably made a wrong turn somewhere yeah i don't think anybody would disagree with the wrong turn i think i look like or hate the last jedi it rubbed a lot of people the wrong way and I just don't mean people that go on YouTube and make videos complaining about it. And I don't mean people that go on X Twitter walks complaining about it. I mean real life people whose faces aren't just eggs on Twitter. I'm talking about real people. Like this movie, when I went to go see it, I've said this before. And I'm, I enjoy The Last Jedi. It's not my favorite. It's not my least favorite. It's somewhere, wherever. I, you know, but like when the movie ended, I remember when The Force Awakens ended. Everybody was like happy, right? They're like, Star Wars is back. Merry Christmas. Rogue One, that was good. That was good. It was, they weren't over the moon like they were for, for Force Awakens. But, but Last Jedi, that movie ended. The theater was silent. And people just got up and walked out. And like the movie or hate the movie, that's not the reaction you want to Star Wars. Star Wars should invoke conversation and joy and you should end it and be like that was awesome let's talk about this let's talk about that and instead it ended with well, let me get my jacket we'll go warm up the car and people left and so when a movie is made to that and then solo comes out and it does what it does rise of skywalker it had rise of skywalker been a more solid movie it would have made more money no question about it but the last jedi the response to the last jedi clearly affected the rise of skywalker Around the same time, the studio experimented with two standalone titles. There was 2016's gorgeous looking and compelling, if wildly uneven. I find, yeah, it is, it's very uneven, yeah. Rogue One, but great ending. Earning one billion, a film whose reputation has improved since it was released. And 2018's wildly panned Solo, which made a disastrous for the, for the franchise, 393 million, a film whose reputation has not improved since it was released. Both had behind-the-scenes drama and reshoots that saw the original directors being replaced during filming. It's funny because the solo replacement was a lot is a lot more known. Like, there's not like people we don't really t discuss the uh, the Rogue One replacement that much, even though obviously we know what happened. We've seen Andor. <laughs> we know we know who actually directed most of Rogue One, or at least the reshoots of Rogue One. And there's been no talk of Gareth Edwards to return, even though fans are like, "Get him back!" It's like, but he didn't really. We probably who knows what he did. I think. If there's a larger issue at play, and it seems to be, you know, remember they were going to make Rogue One a war movie? They were going, Rogue One was, they were like, we're going to put the war in Star Wars. I almost think they might have gone too far on the war, and someone at, I'm going to say Disney, said, uh-uh-uh, uh-uh-uh, you went too far, uh-uh-uh, we got to reel it back, family audience, we need to hit a billion dollars, and they did. And to their credit, they hit that billion dollars. On a movie that's based on a line from a crawl, by the way. After Rise of Skywalker, Disney paused making big screen Star Wars movies altogether, but continued to announce new films in development from top creatives. The list of well-known writers and directors who have come and gone is comically long. Ryan Johnson originally enlisted to make a new trilogy. David Benioff and Dan Weiss also enlisted for a trilogy. Patty Jenkins, Colin Trevor Trevorrow, Damon Lindelof, David S. Goyer, Josh Trank, Gilmore Del Toro, Taika Waititi, and Marvel Chief Kevin Feige. Some of your projects, some of their projects were confidentially announced as movies that were definitely happening until they weren't. And there are others that are that were never revealed publicly. Like they're just like it's just like it's frustrating. 
Because you know some of those were probably good, some of them were probably terrible. And they weren't all officially announced, but some of them were. And then there's even more that we don't know about. They're throwing spaghetti at the wall. Boom, boom, boom. boom. That's what, I, I don't know. It just, it, I'm going to talk about it again tonight. Like I said, don't want to harp on it, but you need, and this isn't a knock necessarily on Kathleen, Ka- well, maybe it is, but you need someone that has an understanding, a respect, an appreciation for the lore and mythology <laughs> and themes and themes of Star Wars. Get that person to make your decisions. I, I, they also need a plan, but the hell do I know? If all this seems rather chaotic for a studio that's famously meticulous, well, yes, it does. The charitable read is that Star Wars movies should be very special and the studio is determined to get them right. A batch of projects are still in the works. Jay Mangold in development of Dawn of the Jedi feature. Sure it is! Sean Levy is working on an untitled film. Jenkins' Rogue Squadron was resurrected this year. Uh-huh. Lindelof's feature starring Daisy Ridley's Ray has shifted to director Charmin Obeid Shinoy. It's uncertain which of these, if any, will be made. Even as the studio spat out announcement after announcement on the film side, Disney largely switched its focus to bringing Star Wars to TV for a Disney Plus streaming service, which was it was great, but a mistake. Star Wars belongs on the silver screen, not the small screen. And I love the small screen. I love Star Wars. I love getting it weekly on the thing. But at the same time, I haven't got a Star Wars movie in five years. We're going on five years without a Star Wars movie. And I know you, you know, you got cold feet wet feet cold feet about making another one because of the box office declining but the last one still made up a billion dollars i'm gonna go see it people want, people love the first two seasons of mandalorian and you can say what you want about the third season of mandalorian but it had views we're gonna they're gonna talk about that in a second mandalorian season three people watched it they might have hate watched it and been like what happened to the mandalorian i loved but they watched it mandalorian got views that's why it's getting a movie they, season three should have been a movie that thing would have been better as a movie, and it should have been a movie, and whatever. The shows, I could bring them in warm, I could bring them in cold. Wait, I could bring you in warm, I could bring you in cold. I'm a really good voice actor, guys. Once again, Disney came out of the gate incredibly strong. The 2019 debut season of John Favreau's The Mandalorian nearly single-handedly made Disney Plus an out-of-the-box success, charmed critics and audiences and was even nominated for an Emmy for Best Drama. Moreover, The Mandalorian proved live-action Star Wars on TV was possible. It's easy to forget this show was considered a big gamble at the time, given Fabro Fabro also launched the MCU with 2008's Iron Man. He deserves to be honored at one of those medal ceremonies on Yavin. Absolutely. Absolutely. In Season 3, The Mandalorian creatively stumbled a bit, ratings slipped a little, and the show received backlash for the first time. It's funny, though. Like, they're talking about it. It's, It's actually, it's funny. How like Force Awakens and Mandalorian like hit the ground running. People loved it. They were drawn to it. It was like Force Awakens was like Star Wars is back. And Mandalorian was like Star Wars is back. And then it's almost like, you know, you you go full Luke in the Millennium Falcon and Hans turned back like, don't get cocky, kid. And they went Anakin and got cocky. That Disney Disney went Anakin and got cocky. For the Mandal from the Mandalorian came. 2021 spin-off Book of Boba Fett, which was is where some problems with the franchise's TV efforts first emerged. I liked it, but everybody else, I get it. So much about this brief effort was weirdly clunky. Two Mandalorian episodes were inexplicably sandwiched into the show's seven, and they felt like the band-aid, like a band-aid effort to repair a struggling show. The Book of Boba Fett was originally a series, not a mini-series, but it was quickly considered concluded. See, I think like the obviously yes it failed and that didn't do a, a second season or whatever but like at the same time i felt like that was that should have been a one and done also it was called the book of boba fett and like i said i did enjoy it most people didn't but you shove in mando in two episodes like they said like all of a sudden it becomes a mandalorian season 2.5 which maybe I, and I, I i've said this a million times but stop calling shows and movies after your characters and they're Star Wars. It, it probably they probably should have incorporated more into Mando. And but like this is, you know, like the last Jedi was eight point five or seven point five. Like I said, this was Mando two point five. This should they should have been like, here's a side story about Boba Fett that takes place during the events of the Mandalorian, or something like that. I don't know what you do. You handcuffed yourself with titles again. Titles are whatever. You're pissing me off with your titles. <laughs> Stop it. Twenty twenty two's Obi Wan. 
Kenobi from showrunner director Deborah Chow. Fans were excited to see Ewan McGregor reprise his role as Obi Wan and Hayden Christensen return as Darth Vader. And he was also Anakin. The show is likable enough despite some weak sequences and a winner in the ratings. Obi Wan Kenobi opened to 1.3 billion minutes of viewing, according to Nielsen, even bigger than Mando season three's opening of 823 million, and concluded with a strong 860 million for its finale. Obi Wan Kenobi was a limited series, however, and there are no current plans for more episodes. And I think making Obi Wan Kenobi limited is smart on every level, but at the same time, dumb because it is your. It was their creme de la creme, if you will. I think um, I think Ewan McGregor is a fan. I, I know he's a fan favorite. Everybody loves Ewan McGregor. Everyone loves Obi-Wan Kenobi. And you have this show and it hits stumbling blocks. And I don't think it was perfect. I actually don't think it was. I think it had a lot of highlights. It did. There was some cool stuff in there, but it was just, it was just a mess all around it convoluted there was just too much going on they have to a lot of these series when they start to get messy it's because they lose their focus like we just mentioned mandalorian appearing in book of Buffett. they lose the focus of what makes the show the show uh, accolade is a prime example of this uh, there was no focus on that show it's just like hey, it's all over the place and that there's like like reel it in tell me one story one isolated story let me like let's see that then you can flesh it out how everyone after but that's part of the problem so Obi Wan Kenobi, though a limited series, it makes sense because I, I really like I, he's watching Luke. But the story they gave us, I don't think justified that. I think if I think Obi Wan Kenobi would be would do them well to do one more mini series of Obi Wan Kenobi. Maybe don't call it Kenobi, maybe call it something else, but have Obi Wan Kenobi be your lead and really give him a strong. Obviously, it's not a send off. But a strong send off for you and McGregor in the role, and you can bring back Kenan Christensen as Anakin for flashbacks or whatever as well. But no more Vader. I think I, I think we just don't touch Vader anymore. I think I think Vader's good. I mean, I'd watch more Vader. I'm just saying, it's good. 2022's Andor from Rogue One fixer Tony Gilroy, who returned to make a prequel series to the film, he swooped in to rescue midway through production. Andor was a grown up Star Wars title that felt grounded and heavily used practical effects and on-location filming instead of the LED volume wall technology used by other shows for their backgrounds, which sometimes make them look like blurry stage plays. The show was also massively expensive with a budget estimated up to be as high as $250 million for 12 episodes. Critics and its fans loved the result. However, and Andor was Emmy nominated for Best Drama Series. At 96% of Rotten Tomatoes, Andor is actually the best reviewed live action Star Wars TV show or movie. Andor's ratings did not fully reflect the esteem. It opened with 624 million minutes before falling into 400 million range for subsequent weeks, then jumping back to 674 million for its finale. There will be a second season in 2025 to conclude the story. Gilroy originally pitched the show as five seasons and has said. It was his decision to shorten the project. It would not be surprising if Andor's ratings pop for a season two as more casual Star Wars fans discover the show. And I think I know it was a solid show. I know some people say it was boring and it was a little bit of a slow burn for sure. And they needed to drop those first three episodes all at once to really get you in there. But it was a solid show. I can see the ratings going up for it as well. I did a video where I mentioned how the ratings were like massive and somebody like commented like, are you an idiot? They were huge. They weren't huge. They're telling you right here they weren't huge. Facts are facts, yo. Facts are facts. 2023's Ahsoka from Clone Wars Mastermind and Mandalorian co-chief Dave Filoni. Now, in the live-action driver's seat for the first time, the show received positive views, 86% of Rotten Tomatoes, and a somewhat mixed reaction from the fans. Ahsoka's premiere ratings were comparable to the Mandalorian Season 3 opener, 829 million minutes, and its decline to an average around 570 million minutes for the rest of its run. A second season was announced as in development in January, and sources say the new season will go into production next year. I Look, I was loving Ahsoka, and then it just kind of fizzled. It fizzled away, and I know there's a second season, but there was no promise of a second season. It wasn't like this is the first half. Like, you know, Netflix drops like six, three episodes, and like, you get the next three in a month. Like, it wasn't like that. It was kind of like it just stopped, and I was disappointed. I was let down by that. I'm like, okay, where are you going? Because I thought Balin Skull, Shin Hati, two of the most intriguing characters we've gotten since 2012 in star wars like they're just phenomenal characters i'd like to see more learn more about these characters and they were underutilized especially the last episode obviously where they just kind of show up and i mean they're cool moments but they don't do anything really you know they're, they're there okay 
all right, we, we kind of hinted at what's going on. But I talked to some casual fans that don't, you know, aren't obsessed with Star Wars who love the Mandalorian, and they were they found it boring. And they're like, I don't understand what's going on. I think the the Rebels characters, I think Rebels has some of the best characters that Star Wars has created also. But those characters need to be fleshed out more for live action for the fans that don't know who they are to give them a better understanding of what that is. And I think that's why you see the ratings kind of start to decline also because you're like, oh, this looks cool. Who are these people? And you don't really get much of a, like like so being obsessed with finding Ezra, if you don't know who they are, are you that invested in that storyline? And frankly, as someone who was, I wasn't even that invested in that storyline, to be honest, because it was way too easy to get to Ezra. It was way, way too easy to get to Ezra. But that's a, that's a, that's a conversation for another day. It was, I, I was really enjoying the show until the end. 2024 is the accolade from creator Leslie Headland. The series was set 100 years before The Phantom Menace, which was a great move uh, and thought. And it had a franchise most diverse cast along with several female leads. The New York Times revealed the eight-episode series costs $180 million, only $10 million less than Dune Part 2. All right. The Acolyte received largely po- positive critic reviews, 70% of Rotten Tomatoes, and sparked raging culture war battle that once again exposed the ugly side of online fandom. The Acolyte's backslash and criticism is, a difficult, is difficult to parse as many fans detail their creative objections to the show's storytelling and its bold take on Jedi lore. Just because we didn't like this doesn't mean we're racist, basically. Some other accolade bashers were, well, clearly racist. The accolade, look, also, yeah, that's that's true. Some of them obviously were, but I also think there was a narrative shoved down everyone's throats before the show was even released that you have to like the show or you're racist. And and that's, I did a video, like, Star Wars has a massive PR problem. They have a PR problem. That's like, the out of the gate, that's not something you talk about. Also, they got talked to the media. The media talking to the creators behind the stuff. I think they were sabotaged, man. They're talking about everything but the show. Talk about the show. Tell me about the show. Because one thing, Leslie Headland, whatever. Like I wasn't. I didn't think the show was very good. I didn't think she did a good job on the show. I just don't think it was. But, but from some of the interviews, I got she's a massive Star Wars fan, like a legit Star Wars fan. And the media should have should have pointed her in that direction to let the fans know how big of a fan she is and how much this material means to me how much to her how much she respects the lore the themes and and the characters and all that that's what they should have pushed but instead they pushed they pushed narratives that have nothing to do with what we're watching on the screen and all you're doing is creating a separation and pissing people off and it's just it's pr man pr the Acolytes premiere ratings were the lowest to date for a live action Star Wars series launch, 488 million minutes, according to Nielsen's US streaming figures. Then the show's ratings sunk further, with the Acolyte dropping out of Nielsen's top 10 entirely for several weeks, not typical for a Star Wars show. It was impossible for Disney to spin this as one as a concluded story. The season ended on a cliffhanger, but the Acolyte is not getting a season two. The cancellation has been portrayed by some defenders as baffling. Even conspiratorial what but the show ratings trend and reception point to a pragmatic decision on the studio's part look man the show didn't do well i thought the trailers were bad i thought the poster was amazing i thought the trailers looked bad i thought it looked like a cw show no offense to cw shows but they're on the cw they're not on disney plus they don't have a budget that ballooned to 300 million dollars some people are reporting so yeah people didn't watch it they weren't invested they said this isn't for me i'm moving on you can't spin that any other way. Look, and if you like the accolade, I'm not bashing you like the I like you can like the accolade all you want. I like crap. I'm not saying it's crap. It wasn't my favorite, but it wasn't crap. But like if you like it, that's fine. But if people don't watch it, like what do you like you can't they spent three hundred million dollars on something people didn't watch. What do you think's gonna happen? Of course they're gonna cancel it. Of course they are. On December third, Disney is launching John Watts and Christopher Ford's skeleton crew, which centers on a group of children embarking on a space adventure, making an all ages rating smash is difficult nowadays. So having skeleton crew focus on kids like Andor is targeted to grownups might be a smart play. The creators have strongly suggested the show will be another one and done limited series, but Lucasfilm considering skeleton crew series, unless ratings decide otherwise. And I'm glad the creators are at least saying it's a one and done. I'm glad for that. Because at least, I, I, theoretically, it'll have a, an ending. You know, the kids will go back to their homes or something. I don't know. But I'm glad about that because I just, I can't take any more cliffhangers or, or not even cliffhangers, like series that just don't have 
a conclusion. Although Mandalorian season, all the Mandalorian seasons have had conclusions, though. You can't say that. Even Book of Boba Fett had a conclusion. I guess Kenobi did too. Maybe it's just the accolade. Andor was. Anyway. <laughs> so that's six live action shows in five years. Just one, The Mandalorian, has been an outright hit with critics and fans and has delivered a multi season run, which is a traditional model for TV success. This doesn't mean a single season of TV cannot be a win. Limited series are considered hits all the time, but there's a reason popular close-ended limited series like the debut seasons of HBO's The White Lotus and FX Shogun were given second season orders and became ongoing series. Making a show that can run for multiple seasons is a typical goal, even for streamers, because it encourages subscribers to stick around. There are also considerable startup costs to making something new, particularly in the fantasy space. Enormous amounts of production, costume, and prop design, and all-around world-building. The Acolyte Season 1 took four years to make, but a second season would have likely only taken half that time. With an ongoing series, a company doesn't have to work so hard and spend so much to keep re-earning its audience. One would think Disney would have wanted more juice from some of these squeezes. Again, the, the, the Kenobi one is the one that baffles me, like... Ratings were massive, then they went down, and they spent way less money on it than they did the Acolyte. And you could do another season, call it a limited... Like, and, and the thing with Obi-Wan is it could be limited. Like, You could just tell a bunch of standalone Obi-Wan stories, like this is what he did this week while looking after Luke, and you could just watch those. It's baffling that they wouldn't milk that, that cow. Because that's, that's a cow, and he wants to be milked. He wants to be milked. Because what is left for Disney Plus after Skeleton Crew? The final season of Andor and a second season of Ahsoka. In 2020, Disney bullishly announced 10 new Star Wars shows at an investor event, heralding a glorious new era of Star Wars TV. <sighs> Those entries included Lando, now being redeveloped by star Donald Glover and his brother Steven into a film, and Rangers of the New Republic, scrapped for reasons. <laughs> There's a way to put it. The prospect of being left with a single ongoing live-action Star Wars show after Andor concludes surely wasn't the company's hope coming out of that announcement. Hanging over all of this is the increasing suspicion that the company may have wrung out the rag, creatively speaking, on storylines culled from Lucas's original trilogy and its prequels. Even the accolade haters should have should give the show credit for telling a story that's far removed from the Skywalker saga, as the skeleton crew. This isn't entirely Disney's fault, but it's one of the challenges moving forward. How do you make Star Wars feel fresh and new while still feeling like Star Wars and, let, and not say Rebel Moon? The company has enjoyed more con consistent results on the animated side, which has been largely championed by Filoni. Uh, shows such as Rebels, Bad Batch, Visions, and Tales of the Jedi were critically acclaimed and well-liked by fans. Visions and Rebels have the highest Rotten Tomato scores for Star Wars content, tied at 98%. Another title, Resistance, received about one-third of the Nielsen viewership of Rebels and ended after two seasons, with its creators saying that the story was simply finished. Yeah... I look, you want to make Star Wars fresh and new? I think you know, Lucas was like, I want to go forward, I want to go forward. And I think Disney painted themselves in a corner, Lucasfilm Disney painted themselves in a corner with the sequel trilogy being the sequel trilogy, and then the reaction that it got. Had they planned it out, maybe you would have got somewhere. I think the new course of action, what it appears that they're taking with this Ray movie, maybe being on hold, maybe not, is you, you settle down, you stay in your lane, you focus on your Mando verse characters. And you let them take you on on this journey, and this journey can go twenty years. It can go past the sequels, but I think you have to get to that point. I think we need to see what the galaxy is like after the Empire and things are like. I want like I'm saying this thing, but I want to see something like in between uh, the prequels and the original trilogy. Like, what was that? There was a middle section that we haven't seen yet, where technology, like it's still some of it's still crisp and clean, and some of it is is used in junkie like the ot like i want to see what where is that like let's get that but let's get that in reverse obviously we're going from the ot into the st well the st is still the ot because they didn't change it so they go from like the st to whatever so i think these new characters can take us there i think that that should be their focal point now is, is fleshing out the characters they have established on disney plus especially and then bring them to the movies um and then do what you can with the movies because i think even like a new hope you know like all those characters are fleshed out but we don't really real like they don't go through there's not a lot of learning about the characters in there right like you know luke is a farm boy han is a pirate chewie's awesome leia's a princess that's all you need
Uh, and what about Disney Plus subscriptions? Aren't subscriptions the real coin of the realm here? Disney Plus took off a, like a rocket in 2019, steadily climbed to peak in the fourth quarter of 2022 with 164 million subs worldwide, then started dropping for the first time to currently settle around 153 million. Lucasfilm president Kathleen Kennedy, who has produced some of the most beloved and iconic movies in cinema history, in addition to successful, successfully relaunching Star Wars and cinemas with force and trailblazing it to TV with Mando, has overseen the Star Wars franchise since 2012. Any mention of Kennedy amid a, a look at the Star Wars track record cannot be separated from the fact that she has been the target of hateful and ugly fandom attacks. Uh -huh. South Park also piled on by mocking her in a recent episode. Still, Kennedy shouldn't be concerned considered immune from criticism and one thing recent political headlines have shown is the myth of only i can do it leadership on the parks front the company doesn't publicly release the attendance numbers for each land so it's tough to clock exactly how star wars land galaxy's edge is faring at disneyland's across the planet. the company's third quarter investor report stated the attraction remains one of the most popular in the park and ranks number one in guest satisfaction they also sold 1.2 million lightsabers <laughs> So that, I, I've only heard good things about it, so I don't know. But in 2023, the company's infamous Star Wars interactive hotel experience, Galactic Star Cruiser, which reportedly cost nearly $1 billion, spectacularly blew up like Alderaan, shutter, shuttering its windowless cabins and blue milk slinging cantinas after one year. And I heard it was actually uh, way better than... Than you would have thought. The stealth gold mine of franchise remains merchandising. Disney typically doesn't release numbers for individual product lines, but sources say Star Wars merch generated a billion for the company last year. Baby Yoda has surely been a retail godsend, though it's hard to imagine Basil action figures flying off the shelves. But Basil should be flying off the shelves. Basil should be flying off the shelves. Like, yeah, but he's not. Obviously, for reasons. We all know why. I'm not going to harp on it, but he should be. During a presentation in March to fight an activist investor who accused the company of overspending, Disney also revealed Lucasfilm has generated nearly $12 billion in total revenue on its $14 billion investment. There's so much stuffed into this fuzzy umbrella number, however, make, including non-Star Wars titles and projects, future, projected future returns, and also so much left out, like the cost of everything. So it's tough to know what to make of that $12 billion other than Star Wars generates a lot of money when you probably already knew. So let us, at long last, get back to the big question in the headline. Is Disney bad at Star Wars? On balance, no. No? Really? I wouldn't disagree. I, I think the answer is no also. I think, you know. Star Wars, uh, Disney gave Star Wars fans what they wanted for decades. A lot more Star Wars from different visionary filmmakers, and some of it has been terrific. A dormant franchise that once followed a sing single dynastic storyline has exploded into a more diverse galaxy of characters and stories. Even the off maligned sequel trilogy has sequences within each film that are arguably stunning. For all its narrative flaws, the Rise of Skywalker's farewell scene between Han Solo and Kylo Ren is as moving as anything in canon. And shows like The Mandalorian and or Rebels clear even the highest bar a hardcore fan might reasonably set. A lot of the online uproar is a sign of audience are is a sign audiences are at least still very engaged and care about the franchise. A truer sign of failure would be apathy and disinterest. But here's another question. Could Disney be better at Star Wars? Clearly, yes. A hondo percent. The company's live action movies and TV efforts on average could be should be better in 2018 disney ceo bob Iger admitted the company made a mistake with star wars making movies a little too much too fast after Iger temporarily left the company in 2020 disney lucasfilm arguably made the same error again on the tv side lucasfilm famously instructed his actors to be faster and more intense but that doesn't typically work as a franchise strategy as marvel has discovered as well it's unclear if Star Wars requires more order or less, more empire-like corporate oversight or more rebellion-like creative chaos, but it's long seemed like there's somehow too much of both, which has resulted in a master plan that's constantly being rewritten and content that sometimes, fe that sometimes feels undercooked and clunky. It's not the fault of fans that they increasingly have a bad feeling about this. 100%, you can't blame the fans for not liking something. And they do that. That's the problem is they do that. They come out and they attack the fans. Like, you don't like it? And then they attack you. You're the problem. I was going to talk a little bit, but Variety did a whole article on that. 
they're changing the way they're making movies based on fandoms being mad because you're changing what the fandoms like about the IP to begin with. It makes no sense. So fans are allowed to, I think, you know, there's obviously a line. You can't cross a certain line, but fandoms are allowed to be mad. Let's not. Any criticism from the sidelines, however, should be tempered with one final point. Making a successful Star Wars project is really hard. Marvel movies with their iconic staple of heroes who can be portrayed by different actors are arguably easier. I would agree. Lucas created this thing and had and made six live action Star Wars films over several decades and only his first two were widely considered excellent by critics and fans alike. Many younger fans adore his prequels, though they were never much loved by critics. Case in point, Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Two stars right here. This is Rolling Stone with Peter Travers. And it's he goes on like, uh, look, clumsy director and tenured writer George Lucas. There's Star Wars bashing has been a, a forefront forever. Forever. We forget that, you know, we pretend the prequels were loved for 24 years, but that's not, not, even, not even a fact. This is also what makes making more content so tempting. The original Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back were profoundly amazing and so captivating generations and so captivated generations of fans and have included literally thousands and have launched literally thousands of products and generated billions in direct and ancillary revenue. In 1981, Lucas changed the title of the first film, Star Wars to A New Hope, and the name is apt. It's literally what's fueled to executives, creators, and fans ever since. Each time another Star Wars title opens with a rousing fanfare, a scroll, and a star field. All of us get that same feeling, a new hope, over and over again. So that's that article. I'll link it below. I got to, oh man, I got to go up. I forgot to say who wrote it. All the way up. Uh, this was written by James Hibbard. I think James Hibbard hit the nail on the head on this one. I do. I think there's a lot more good has come from this era of Star Wars than bad. I mean, it might not be as strong as, as the youth of a lot of people. It might not be as strong as George Lucas. Six, I don't think it's been as strong as George Lucas's six movies. I think George Lucas is uh, a narrative genius. I think he can, he's a storyteller, a mastermind at, at stories and, and the complexities within now, you know, dialogue and whatnot maybe not so much, but yeah, I don't think we've had that level yet on Disney, but at the same time we've had five movies and all of these shows and, you know, there's been hits and misses, but they've produced a lot more content, a lot more product than George Lucas did. And I'm hoping they've, you know, it's taken 12 years, but I'm hoping now they've got their feet wet and they have this understanding. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping the Mando and Grogu movie is, is the first step in the right direction, a lower budget, and a master plan because we know everything's leading to the Filoni movie, which is set to be involving this Mando verse. So that's my hope is this is the first step into a larger plan. So in my opinion, is Disney bad at star Wars? No. Are they great at it? No. Are they okay at it? Sure. <laughs> They're not perfect at it. They have, there's been a lot of ups and downs and, you know, maybe, you, and maybe stop spending a bazillion dollars on, on streaming series that people aren't subscribing to your channel for but that's all i have to say let me go let me know what you guys think in the comments down below thanks for watching everybody like subscribe do all the fun stuff we'll see you next time may the force of others be with you yeah.